I just want to briefly, you know, introduce our speakers for this session. We've got Alex Vitakovich, who, you know, works or is part of Monkeys in Town, but has also worked on a number of different Finnerac projects throughout the community, also assisting Fitter as well. So he's been a long-standing member of the community, a member of our PMC and release manager as well. And Ishvan is calling in from Hungary as part of DPC. He's worked on a number of enterprise-grade Finnerac projects. And the other speakers who will be joining us soon, they've also worked on scaling out and building out, you know, high quality enterprise grade solutions on top of the Finnerac code base. So Alex is going to lead us through a presentation that walks through a number of, you know, suggestions around modularizing the architecture, but also taking a look back at, you know, some of the questions that have been raised throughout Apache Khan around, you know, Finnerac 1.x and Finnerac CN and what's the future, et cetera. And then Ishvan and other speakers are going to add their thoughts in as well. But Alex will be leading the majority of today's session. So I'll pass it on to you, Alex, and thanks for pulling together this valuable presentation, which I think will provide a good, you know, start off point for the rest of the community to engage in an architectural working group and help to get many of these changes implemented and contributed back into to upstream. So take it away. All right. So I just turn off my, my camera because my uh, connection could be choppy here and there. Um, but for the presentation, it should be okay. Um, just let me switch a little bit here. So, um, just to set the stage a little bit, and as a uh, small intro, um, so everyone knows that um, we have uh, Finnerect uh, 1.x and also Finnerect uh, CN. And uh, the question now is a little bit you know, why argue um, uh, with modularity and uh, pushing forward Finnerect 1.x when there is a newer thing. Um, but um, just to ensure everyone, development is uh, progressing for both of them in parallel because um, Finnerect uh, 1.x keeps uh, uh, being uh, hugely popular. It has a lot of features. People invested a lot of uh, time and effort. And um, Finnerect CN, um, is uh, built for higher scale and um, fr from the ground up uh, with lessons learned uh, from Finract 1.x, um, but it uh, lags a little bit behind uh, in terms of business features. So it's not really yet on, on par with uh, Finract 1.x. Um, uh, and, um, but um, I should uh, ensure everyone, so Finnerac uh, CN is moving towards its first release. Um, I have to um, mention transactional accounts. I'm not really that familiar with that. So if anyone has questions with that, please um, ask Ed uh, with, uh, because of that. Um, so uh, personally, I have to say my uh, 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 I'm uh, more involved with Finrak uh, 1.x and um, know a little bit uh, um, where the um, challenges are mostly. <laughs> um, I still have to deep dive into Finrak uh, CN. Um, but um, just to tell that, um, today's uh, talk is uh, not uh, in any way uh, directed towards you know uh, replacing one with the other. Um, I think it's safe to say that we will live with Finrect 1.x uh, for still a little while. And so it makes sense to see um, how we, uh, we can um, uh, improve. Um, uh, for me, it's uh, mostly developer experience, uh, but also um, seeing how uh, we can uh, put some uh, um, performance improvements in place, uh, more fixes, um, there is um, uh, some challenges, for example, bringing um, uh, uh, fixes back to upstream uh, from all the partners that we have. So we will talk about that a little bit. And um, maybe we can also define the scope of um, uh, uh, these improvements. So I, I don't think that we will be able to fix all the cracks uh, that uh, Finnerc 1.x might have. Uh, because, um, you know, uh, that can take maybe uh, unlimited time, right? So, which we don't have. Um, so, let's see what uh, we can do. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview uh, what uh, people came up with um, to um, 
speed up FinArt, um, um, make it uh, harden it a little bit in, uh, pro in a production environment, right? So there are low hanging fruits like um, replacing the JDBC driver, um, the connection pool library that is uh, used out of the box, uh, DBCP, which is a sister Apache product, um, is also not the fastest kit in town. Um, the default uh, in Spring Boot world is actually Hikari. Uh, so that uh, speeds up things uh, quite a bit. Um, there are some default settings uh, for the embedded Tomcat uh, servlet container. Um, that um, can also be improved. Uh, so for example, um, the default HTTP connector that comes uh, with the default configuration with uh, Tomcat is also not the fastest. It used to be the blocking input output uh, uh, connector. So thankfully that is not the default one anymore. Um, but there is even a faster one, the Neo2 uh, connector and um, not sure why this is not the default, um, but um, we had uh, quite some uh, nice experiences with uh, that configuration. This is, you know, stuff that is a one-liner, for example, right? So not really um, uh, a big deal, um, which is uh, things that are a bigger deal is, for example, we uh, did some experiments with um, uh, doing a little bit of heart, open heart surgery um, in the way that um, uh, FinArt processes um, internal commands. I'll show a little bit of an architecture diagram so um, that we are all on the same page. Um, uh, so uh, we replace that these internal mechanics, um, which are um, executed synchronously, uh, which in itself uh, poses some uh, performance uh, issues in production. Uh, um, with uh, Apache Camel and uh, message queue system in between and um, configured in a way so that it's kind of 99% uh, uh, backwards compatible um, with the uh, upstream uh, um, FinArt uh, release. Um, but um, so these are some tricks that we did. Um, and another low hanging fruit um, depends on who you ask. Um, there are a lot of fans of the multi-tenant feature of uh, Finrak. The problem with that is that it um, introduces a global lock. If you uh, go down the rabbit hole and search a little bit in the source code, you will see that there is a fairly small uh, um, uh, uh, sized uh, code piece um, that is um, uh, surrounded with a synchronized uh, keyword. Uh, the problem with that is that um, this this synchronized um, uh, section is passed with every request and on every cache um, uh, 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 call. So um, that slows down things quite a lot. Um, there's at the moment no way to turn this on, off, for example. Um, my question here is always how how many production uh, deployments do you have where you actually uh, need the multi-tenant feature? Right, so that's uh, something uh, that that uh, we used or we turned off uh, to speed things up. Another thing is just using a different uh, JVM. Um, my personal favorite is uh, uh, the Zulu JVM from Azul. Um, the one distinguishing feature that it has is uh, it it has a low latency garbage uh, collector, um, so um, you can just run it. And um, okay, yes, there are uh, physical limitations, <coughs> so you can run out of memory. Um, but at least um, you, I don't want to say you can't run into um, a garbage collection um, uh, 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 pause uh, situation, um, but it's very hard. Right? It's not like with the default uh, um, Oracle JVM. Um, then um, would, the next point is um, a little bit of black magic, as we know, right? So JVM parameters, um, we did a lot of uh, experimentations uh, with that um, to make things faster and uh, to avoid that uh, FinRAC is starving out of memory. Um, 
more intrusive changes um, are surrounding um, fixing uh, SQL statements. Um, so very often um, in Finneract upstream, we have situations where uh, the SQL statements don't really take into account that um, data can grow, right? So when we have 100 entries in the table, so SQL statements can be pretty much any uh, shape and form uh, that you want. Um, but when this grows to millions of entries, um, some optimizations uh, are usually required or something like paging or other um, uh, strategies. Right? Um, other things uh, um, that people do is um, kind of creating microservices. So we know that uh, Finract is a monolithic uh, piece of software. Um, but um, you can run uh, um, multiple instances of Finract and um, let those instances do different things. For example, um, uh, very easy to do is uh, you have one instance that's just as um, REST API calls, right? So the executing the normal business logic in, in quotes. Uh, then you have another instance that um, runs the background jobs. Uh, which is also something that uh, requires quite some resources. And then uh, maybe another uh, uh, instance of Finrag that just is only there for um, the reporting features. Um, there are some more um, um, uh, sophisticated approaches. Um, uh, you talked with uh, Istvan yesterday about that, so maybe he's the better person to um, uh, update uh, you about that. So one of the challenges with the uh, background jobs in Finrag is um, that it's all or nothing, right? So either they run through um, the whole thing or it, it just fails and then it might put your um, system in a uh, inconsistent state because sometimes jobs are depending on each other and it's very um, hard to um, resume from there, right? So um, having something like uh, resumable jobs, uh, that would be a, a really nice thing. I want to point you to um, uh, Frank's uh, uh, talk from yesterday. He, he listed quite some uh, stuff that goes into somewhat that direction, but he has more examples um, about uh, improvements. Second. So, um, let's see. Um, so the idea is that we um, uh, modularize um, uh, Finact one dot x and um, try to. One second, just exit it. Sorry for that. So um, the idea now is to um, uh, split up Finract and create modules and um, uh, see if we can uh, make the customizations, for example, um, a little bit more flexible. Um, there are all kinds of solutions and workarounds that partners found, found over time, but sometimes it's really hard to uh, contribute those back um, to Finract upstream because it's very easy that these customizations uh, get mixed up, you know, with uh, some small fixes that would be nice uh, to include back to in, in the original project. Um, but then this gets mixed up with um, uh, um, custom, uh, like client uh, uh, customizations that sh uh, should be kept private. And um, this is uh, like a direct effect of uh, that monolithic um, uh, code base that we have right now. Um, uh, so um, splitting up the code in, in separate jar files, uh, and we have to see how uh, exactly that should look like, right? But 
having separate jar files for um, some parts of the system and publishing them, uh, especially to Maven Central, that would be um, uh, um, the goal here, right? Um, so, uh, right. Let's look at the architecture of uh, Finract. Um, so just to uh, um, lay out, uh, you know, the moving parts uh, um, in case you don't remember everything. So we have a REST API layer, fairly classic um, uh, um, uh, Spring Boot application, right? So we are using JAXA REST. Um, unfortunately, we are still stuck with um, version one of um, Jersey. So there is already a, a newer library for that, right? Um, but uh, we have um, uh, some, um, so code that is depending on, on, on Jersey directly. So that's why um, it's still there. Um, one problem that we have in the REST API layer is um, the lack of type safety. Um, so this is not directly related uh, to the, the topic, um, but I'm just mentioning, right? So there are all kinds of um, issues that uh, we could solve, but maybe it's out of scope uh, for the mon modularity thing, right? So um, lack of type safety, just an example. Um, when we receive um, post or put requests, um, then um, the request bodies are basically first uh, put into a string blob, right? Instead of um, having, for example, uh, Jackson and uh, a JSON parser automatically mapping it to a Java object. Um, this mapping is happening actually map uh, manually at the moment, and we are using JSON for that. And um, so there is a lot of code involved in, in that. My personal uh, uh, estimation is that this makes up maybe 10 or 15% of the code base. So it's quite a lot of stuff that we are dragging around with that. And um, maybe one day uh, we can get rid of this. Maybe modularity is uh, the way towards that, right? I don't know. Um, but um, when we do an API request to Finract and the REST API layer, right, then um, a portion of uh, these requests are translated into so-called commands. Um, I'm not going to explain CQRS, uh, so that's the underlying, uh, underlying concept. Um, uh, I refer to Wikipedia or uh, actually Microsoft has a lot of documentation on that. But that's the idea implemented here, right? So um, especially everything that changes data is uh, translated into uh, commands, right? Uh, then we have a central command processing service. Uh, this is like a um, injectable, spring injectable service. And um, that command processing service is only there to translate these incoming uh, commands into um, and map them to so-called handler classes. And these handler classes are executing the actual um, business logic, right? So in one of these handlers, you could have a client service and a, a loan service injected and uh, some business logic is executed with uh, those services, right? And then ultimately, obviously, then uh, data is landing in a MySQL instance. And the uh, whole execution path here is uh, synchronous, which is important to say um, because um, there is just uh, no way. Um, uh, so there, there is some um, um, uh, retry mechanics uh, built into this uh, command processing service, um, but it's a little bit problematic. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, in a worst case, it can take up to 10 seconds uh, uh, as a waiting time between retries. And as the whole execution is asynchronous, um, you know, you have sometimes uh, um, at peak times, a lot of requests here, let's say thousands, right? And they are basically um, executed one after the other, right? Because they are sharing the, the same resources here. And, um, 
that leads into some um, problems then in high volume systems. Um, but that's uh, then something that we can uh, discuss later. Um, this is just as a quick overview. Uh, some stats about the code. Um, the code is quite big. Uh, we have approximately 300,000 lines of code. Um, this code is um, actually well organized. Uh, if, if you look at this, um, I'm uh, having uh, invented these uh, this this vocabulary here a little bit uh, from now on, right? So, because there's no official naming for that. But we have around 12 top level uh, categories. Uh, like these top level categories are um, infrastructure, portfolio, uh, these things that we um, deal with on a daily basis, right? And when you look into these uh, categories, um, I've picked up here a rather large example. Um, so uh, there's this a category called portfolio. And this uh, uh, category contains 29 modules. So I called it uh, modules because it kind of looks, you know, like a good suggestion to cut the things along those lines. Um, let me show you a little bit of a picture, right? So this is, um, these are those uh, 12 uh, top level categories that we have in the, in the code. So this looks already quite nicely to chop up things along those lines, right? And then if we go um, uh, a level deeper, so as an example, portfolio, because I think it's one of the biggest uh, categories, so a category with the most uh, modules contained, then you can see we have accounts, uh, collateral, the usual suspects here. Um, and um, when you look at this from this uh, top level, this could be a nice way to um, split up things and um, create separate jar files, right? So we still have to see how these jar files would look like or if there would be just one jar file per such a module or if we want to even detail that a little bit more, right? Um, could be that there is a, a client core file, that there is a client service file, you know, something along those lines. This is then something that we can decide as a technicality. Um, but just to show what the, what the um, uh, structure here is, here I'd like to show you a little bit what the problem currently is. Because if you look on the high level um, here, that looks all fine. If you um, uh, try to investigate what the actual dependencies are from such a module, and I picked up um, the portfolio client module because it's a rather simple one, right? So there's not, uh, let's say, compared to the loan product module, for example, it's not a lot of stuff happening here. Still, if you just uh, look at the REST API layer, there are already some cross-module dependencies here. In an ideal world, it would be nice to not have these uh, uh, cross-module dependencies. Right? So naturally, we have stuff there uh, like uh, references to JAXA REST frameworks and Spring and Spring Boot. So all these I consider fine. Right? But um, cross-dependencies um, internally in FINRACT, that creates some issues. Right? When you refactor something, you're not touching only that specific module. You have side effects naturally then to other modules too. Right? And here in this case, um, there are three other um, modules. Some of them are not even in the same category. Right? Um, so this is a little bit of, um, uh, of a thing that uh, you know, we have to deal with uh, when we um, do the modularization. Um, there's uh, also good news. Um, so there are uh, very easily identifiable patterns in, in the code base. This is like almost mechanically pretty much all over the place. So we have these resource classes for uh, with JAXRS that uh, uh, comprise the API layer and so on. Then we have data transfer objects. We call them uh, data packages, right? We have domain objects. Uh, these are the ones that are um, mapped to um, database tables. We have uh, 
those manual uh, serializers and deserializers. Uh, so that is uh, maybe something that we can work on and improve, right? So uh, as I said, um, so there are uh, two uh, serializations or mappings that are happening in the system. So first of all, JSON to Java classes. This is done manually, but actually internally, there is also a mapping between the DTO classes and the domain uh, classes. Right, and all of this is done pretty much um, uh, manually, and obviously uh, people came up with all kinds of strategies to do that. So now it's not always obvious uh, how how that you know where the specific code is to do the max. Then we have commands. Um, this is also uh, fairly um, uh, 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 nicely organized. Then we have these uh, business logic handlers, services, repositories to access um, um, uh, uh, the database. Um, it has to be said that here and there, we also have plain SQL code, uh, uh, SQL statements uh, buried in uh, uh, string um, blobs. That's a little bit problematic. I know why people do it because of performance issues. Um, but um, this makes our system uh, less portable, right? Um, and then finally, we have um, jobs. Um, and um, these are kind of a separate uh, uh, subject uh, that we have to talk about, right? So these are, these are a little bit apart from those modules. Um, right, so um, that's uh, for the overview. Um, with that, I would give back to maybe Ed um, and uh, open uh, this discussion um, with everyone. And do. Can we hear each other, or is it? Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alexander. Victor is okay. Right. I believe myself is okay. Ed, Ed, you are the one who's. You, you let me know if, if you need the, the slides as a the visual reference. Or... Oh, and then Ishvan and Victor, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. No, okay. no, it's good. Yeah. Okay. That's why when I made a comment earlier, nobody responded. I was saying, Ishvan, if you wanted to talk to a little bit of your experiences, you know, I know you've taken approaches to separate specific instances or components out as microservices, and you've also been doing some recent scalability testing enhancements. Maybe. Mm -hmm. To the Victor, if you could do the same after his concert. Yeah, all right. So probably I will start with a little bit of uh, what's the purpose of all of this scaling in the one point X. There are, I believe, there are multiple different purposes. So one is this performance that do we want to create more than hundreds of accounts per second or more than hundreds of customers per second? So that's that's one aspect, and and we have had quite a lot of good ideas at what can be done for that. Uh, there's another aspect of uh, this, for example, creating a marketplace that others could contribute modules. 
to this uh, instance of interact i mean again we discussed with, with alexander uh, that that that's that's a potential way that as the modules could be developed and then from this marketplace we can just include some of these uh, modules to the system obviously it needs some standardized apis and certain changes to to make this available uh, this is closely related to the easier contribution purpose. So as we make the modules, then contributors or even the learning curve could be shortened. So others could, could contribute by, without understanding the complete ecosystem, but they can create a new type of product or we, they can create some kind of extensions more easier. And I would say that there's another, again, related purpose that we are not fully 24 by 7 uh, with the 1.x instance so like if you're running the, some of the bad jobs then uh, then you could have issues if you do a loan repayment at the same time so inconsistencies could happen and again this modularization scalability could help in this uh, matter probably there are other purposes for this uh, modularization but that's something that that we could consider. Then a different aspect of this. So in that sense, Fineract could be, or it's already a microservice in a bigger ecosystem. Because if you take a look and what I have seen in my practice now with multiple institutions, that Fineract was used, what is it good for? Managing the accounts. But for loan origination, you use a separate process engine to do that. Or for onboarding customers, KYC related processes, you don't try to push everything inside Fineract. Or what myself was doing, for example, that we implemented a payment processing engine, uh, take it separately to make sure that we orchestrate all these payments and use the account sy accounting system really to manage the accounts but not bother it with the additional processing and retries and timeouts and all of that necessary processing. So that's another approach. And I see that this is really a common approach. And that's why Fineric 1.x is really going pretty well, even in bigger institutions, because it's used only as one service in a, in a much bigger ecosystem uh, that the institution already is having or they are developing independently uh, from the core banking account managing uh, part. Um, and a couple of ideas what I have, uh, some related to the performance improvement purpose, uh, what again we have seen in reality, and it was mentioned by Alexander, that we could use uh, Fineract in let's say in a Kubernetes cluster, that we dedicate a set of pods for certain servicing. Example, uh, it's very important to create the repayment schedules for these loans. Not all of them become a loan account, but then the customers are playing and then they set different settings and they want to see the repayment schedule. So we can dedicate a bunch of instances to serve this type of requirements. Or another set of services could be the one which asynchronously keeps these accounts opened because the repayment schedule is already there. So we have an idea. So you can do this asynchronously, the other um, uh, processing of the platform, for example. Um, and another one that that could be interesting, again, targeting performance, that if you deploy in a cloud platform, that the database uh, typically can be replicated, even more or less synchronously replicated. So you can start dedicating instances for the read-only replicas. So some of the instances, I mean, again, it's, this is not straightforward to do, but can be that you connect them to the read-only replica and they can serve all those APIs, which like looking for account history, looking for repayment history, or all the historical kind of services that a customer service representative or a core center agent uh, requires, uh, or even the customer on his mobile phone uh, is, is asking for. And this way, um, this again could help to, to distribute the load across the multiple instances. And if you need to go even further, 
then comes the sharding uh, concept that you could say that whatever algorithm we select that based on the account number we can distribute them across multiple independent instances um, or or based on the customer name to take a very simple example or or something around it could be utilized uh, to have multiple instances serving a single country uh, for example um, and i have like a couple of more uh, ideas around uh, for example going for postgresql that could also make sense um, again this is also on the performance uh, concept uh, that that uh, that it seems based on our measurements that it 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 giving better results especially if you combine it with a bit of eclipse link <laughs> so then that could that could make a difference um, and as Alexander mentioned, the batch job processing could could see some some different uh, um, let's say implementation. One of the problems that we do have a one batch process affecting all the related accounts, rather than differently that a single job does all the processing on a single account. So we lock the account, we do all kind of processing and then release the account. So then transactions could come in and transactions could be continued on that account. So these kind of the ideas that I have and, and could be also considered to put it to a big list of things and then decide that which one makes sense, which one and what is the timeline for all of these kind of changes. Thanks. Victoria, you. Yeah, um, I agree um, with you talking about the um, how the non-functional and functional uh, requirements can be modularized in FINRA. Also, in our experience, we have tried to reduce the same user interface for mobile, for web application, also for the back office. And we have added another layer, for example, the API orchestrator or the API gateways. If we have these kind of uh, models or modularizing the FINRA, we can uh, expose only the services needed by the financial in in institution. And then it can uh, be easier or can fit more uh, business in, in order to, to have only the the services required by these financial institutions. Um, in, as I have mentioned, in our experience, we have used the API gateways for uh, integrating in the same uh, user interface, the FINRAC and the FINRAC CN, because for one, uh, for, for one uh, business needs, we use the FINRAC for the loan origination and also the loan management, but we need the capacity and the performance of scaling the, the services of the FINERAC CN. And, and that is the, the need that also to, to do a, a, to add an extra layer for orchestrating these um, different uh, services that can be modularized in, in FINERAC. So um, this is our um, proposal also to, to add this layer in front of the, the services that can be modularized. Also, the, the vendors, the, the contributors, and, and the community itself can add a, more functionalities in this marketplace that ISBAN is proposing. And if I can jump in, um, uh, so my my biggest hope from uh, this uh, module more modular approach is also that um, um, it might be easier than to to move uh, um, some some changes uh, uh, forward in a, in a faster fashion. And if if you are confronted with the whole monolithic code base. Then everything you touch is basically then uh, needs to be approved by by you know everyone in the community because everyone is affected. If we split that, this up in uh, smaller modules, then um, less of the code uh, is is affected. Right, so it's like happening only in a specific uh, place, um, and 
we had a conversation yesterday uh, a little bit uh, about the approaches and these cross-module dependencies. I would even argue, as, as much as I like, uh, you know, cleaning up everything, but I, I think that would be the, the, the wrong approach because with that we, we won't have results um, uh, soon. And I think that's that's more important than uh, you know uh, eliminating uh, the dependencies to two other modules. I, mean, uh, I, I had an uh, attempt at, at cleaning up everything like two or two and a half years ago or three years. I, I don't remember. And it's like a rabbit hole where you you don't see the day of light anymore right? because there's this and that. My my go-to example is always the lone Java class. Uh, I think it's a domain class, and I'm not sure anymore because it has so many lines of code. Um, I think it's uh, at 6,000 right now, or a little bit more. That's and, the long uh, part, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, and, and it should have only a private uh, class attributes with uh, the associated getters and setters, right? Um, but I think it's safe to say that it contains quite a, a big chunk of uh, um, business logic. So um, this is there, um, but it's there already for a long time. I, I don't think that it's that important to go after these uh, things because this will break a lot of um, uh, customizations. If, if we touch that, a lot of people rely on that, you know, uh, even if it's aesthetically maybe you know questionable, but it doesn't matter, right? So that stuff I would leave, and and just concentrate on creating jar files, yeah. right? However, we decide that the best way forward is, and and then publish them, and just uh, you know to have uh, um, better uh, developer setups, and also to enable people to. Um, pick and choose and, and, and put the services together a, a, as they need. We, we discussed a little bit, uh, Istvan and, and myself, you know, if it really matters if there is code that is not used, um, I think we both think that it's it's not really that, that bad, right? So if classes are not used, they are not loaded in, in memory, so no, no harm, no foul. Um, but if someone wants to streamline, you know, that Finnerac service and just use um, savings account and, and, and doesn't need all the rest, he, he would be enabled with these modules to just create an instance that just contains that uh, functionality. Mm -hmm. And the other code, if it's not there, then it can't be executed. It could be also, you know, uh, a security feature if you want to, right? Stuff that can be executed, can uh, uh, be used against you. I would add that one of the key things in this modularization that we keep it backward compatible, or at least have a migration path for the existing users that is straightforward. So it's not requires like a super sophisticated, complete data migration to a new database solution, but rather uh, couple of altered tables, new tables, new something structures, but but as much as possible straightforward things. So the existing user base is not going to be impacted by this type of effort. Yeah, thanks, Ishvan. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, Victor. We do have the next session, as Javier noted, coming up around off-grid payments and digital ID led by Orang from Extopain Extolab. So just as a call to action, you know, we're formulating an architectural working group where we'd like to take, you know, the plans and suggestions that Alex and Victor and Ishvan have put forth and start to discuss, you know, what are the priorities there? What are the goals and non-goals we want to achieve? Then actually have, you know, a concrete list of tasks that others can work on, but really to focus on, you know, getting those commercial partners and users in the ecosystem to get individuals from their orgs to commit to taking on some of these enhancements and have a plan to get all this in action and moved into upstream. So we're looking forward to kicking off this plan. And thanks everybody for attending and please try to move into the Thank next you. session. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.